Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming today. So it is my pleasure to host Sebastian as part of our guest lecture series. And I want to give you like a very short introduction of Sebastian. So Sebastian is an English journalist and author. He's the Paul A. Volker Senior Fellow for International Economics at the Council on Foreign Relations. And it's a contributing columnist at the Washington Post. Now, Sebastian has written five books. His latest is The Power Law, Venture Capital and the Art of Disruption, and this is a history of the venture capital industry. I've recommended that book to you guys. It's right here in front of us. OK, well, first of all, Sebastian, thank you so much for being here. Sure. So I want to start our talk today by talking briefly um, in terms of the journey to this point in time. And um, you know, to give you some context, in our class, we talk about entrepreneurial finance. And we often talk about it mostly from the perspective of entrepreneurs. And then when I read your book, it's kind of like the same stories. But you think about it mostly from the perspective of VCs, or this was like my view when I was reading the book. And so the question that I have is, when you were writing the book and when you're researching about it, did it ever occur to you to start thinking about this from the perspective of founders, like thinking about successful companies, what brought them to that point? Or why did you start talking about VCs? And then in the context of that, what do you think is the role of authors in this industry? Is it kind of like retelling the, the stories of what have happened so far, providing some perspective to that industry, and also perhaps connecting to policy implications. OK, that's, that's a lot to start with. Um, can everybody hear me? We're all good? OK, great. Um, so why look at it through the lens of the venture capital, not the entrepreneurs? My starting intuition was that when people write about Silicon Valley history, they tend to focus exactly on the entrepreneurs. The inventors, the entrepreneurs, the Steve Jobses, you know, uh, if you're talking about back in the day, uh, and you think about Intel, then, you know, Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore are the subject of, you know, several books. But the people who financed these things were kind of in the background. They were the eminence crise, the sort of you know, unseen power behind the throne, uh, or even maybe perceived not even to be a power. And something told me that wasn't quite right. Um, and I wanted to sort of go tell the story, the kind of parallel story, which I thought had been neglected. And in the early part of my book, you know, I point out that um, Arthur Rock, the venture capitalist who backed Intel, and in fact, before that, the parent company of Intel, Fairchild Semiconductor, is really a footnote in history. I mean, you, you know, you, there are no biographies of him. There's no, he like almost doesn't get a mention in the standard stories about uh, Intel. And yet, not only did he finance it, not only did he write the stock option plan for them, not only did, um, you know, he was he present at the creation, he then was chairman of the board, um, you know, I know, for, 20-something years, or I forget how long, but a long time. Um, and when you look at what the founders of Intel uh, said about him, uh, you know, Gordon Moore said, you know, I would basically not have founded Intel if I hadn't been pushed into it. I'm not a natural entrepreneur. I was pushed into entrepreneurship uh, by Arthur Rock. And, um, you know, if you start to think about that more and you think, well, being an entrepreneur is a pretty scary uh, prospect. Um, not only are you likely to fail, but it's a pretty lonely uh, path, and you have to solve all these new problems that you've never encountered before, if, you, if this is your first time as an entrepreneur. Uh, and then you imagine um, you know, two environments, one in which the entrepreneur is kind of all alone, and the other in which there is an experienced venture capitalist who is putting money in, skin in the game, and then is helping to solve some of these problems. So just you know, right at the beginning of the journey, imagine the, 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 the entrepreneur who at the moment is an engineer halfway up a big company. And the engineer has an idea. And the boss of the research department of the engineering company says, good idea, but we're not going to do that because if it works, it will cannibalize one of our existing products. There'll be an innovator's dilemma. So we won't do this. So now the engineer is frustrated. And uh, the engineer uh, goes to some social event that weekend, runs into the venture capitalist. So in, in environment one, where there's no venture capitalist, the idea basically is dead. The, the, the engineer has been told not to do it. In environment two, engineer meets venture capitalist and says, I've got this idea, but I can't do it. And the VC says, well, you should go off and start your own company. And the engineer says, yeah, but I don't have any money. And the VC says, don't worry, I've got money. I'll give it to you. 
Uh, and then the engineer says, yes, but how do you even incorporate a company? And the VC says, I know tons of you know, lawyers that do this you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I'll fix that for you. And then the engineer says, yeah, but to build the first prototype, I'm going to need to have five other engineers to help me at the beginning. And the VC says, yeah, well, I know 50 other engineers, and I'll bring you uh, 15 of them, and you can choose the five that you like. Um, and then you know, the engineer finally says, yes, but why would these great engineers leave their comfortable jobs at some big company and come and join a startup, which is risky? And the VC says, yeah, of course it's risky, but I'm going to tell these engineers that if they join your startup and it fails, but they've done a good job, I will get them another job because I invest in lots of startups and I will slot them into somewhere else. And Eric Schmidt, the man who was, of course, the chief executive of Google for a long time, uh, explained to me when I was doing the research that he would never have joined Google in the first place had it not been for the fact that um, you know, the venture capitalist said, uh, to, to him, Eric, if, if the young founders of Google, Larry and Sergey, fire you because they're arrogant and they think that anybody age 30 is stupid, um, you know, don't worry, it could happen. They are arrogant, but I'll just get you another job as the chief executive of another company. So I think basically, you know, the venture capital side of the entrepreneurial story has not been written, is important, and uh, deserved its own book. So I'll, I'll stop there for now, even though you have some other questions. But yeah. Yeah. So there are a couple of interrelated questions that you come back to in the book over and over again. So the first one is, why Silicon Valley and not Boston, let's say? And the second one is, um, <clears throat> why VC matters? Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned the work of sociologist Annalise Axenian a couple of times. And you argue, and I'm paraphrasing here from the book, since her work in the 90s, it has been understood that Silicon Valley overtook Boston because of the quality of its network. Talent and ideas flowed more freely among the small startups of California than among the corporates in Massachusetts. So with her work in the, you know, providing the backdrop of these questions, what do you think are the answers for why Silicon Valley and why does venture capital matter? Yeah, so uh, as you say, Annalise Saxonian came out with this book, it was called Regional Advantage, and it was really excellent. And it was in sort of I think the early 90s it was published. And her analysis was that if you compared you know, the Boston technology cluster, which had historically been stronger than Silicon Valley, uh, MIT was better than Stanford as an engineering school, you know, Harvard was better than Berkeley, and there were tons of defense dollars that were flowing into the area around Boston. You know, the center of the military industrial complex in the 50s had been uh, Boston. So you have Boston and its technology companies leading the way until basically the 1980s when Silicon Valley overtook uh, um, Boston. And what Annalise Saxonian argued is that the industrial sociology of uh, Silicon Valley had all these small companies that were you know, quite fluid and, and so talent moved around. You would join a startup, work there for 18 months, then maybe it would fail you go get another job at another startup, bring your ideas from the first one with you, and work at this one, and then uh, you might hop to another one, and maybe this one now takes off, and you stay there for a while, but you've got all these friends from the previous one, so you know who to hire from your previous companies uh, once your one takes off. And then also, if you get called out by somebody from another company you've never worked with, because at the back of your mind, you know that you're gonna be moving around the Silicon Valley world, and you won't just be at one company all your career, you're inclined to cooperate with that other person, and up to a point anyway, share some insights, maybe not your best secrets, but at least some of them, um, because you know that in the future you may want to collaborate with that person. And so it creates this thing where ideas and money and people circulate around the Silicon Valley ecosystem, and that gives you lots of sort of iterative experiments where you combine the inputs, again, ideas, money, people, in lots of different ways until you get perfect product market fit, you hit, it takes off, you get a big tech success, it goes public. And that's basically a more fertile way of running experiments on, on applied science, which is what a startup does, 
you know, relative to Boston, where you had these big vertically integrated companies, and people didn't move around between them, they didn't talk to each other, they didn't share secrets, they kind of were just frozen in place, right? So that was Annalise Saxonian's big insight. Porous industrial sociology, more creative than sort of siloed vertically integrated companies. And I think what I've added with my book is the question, you know, okay, so it's porous in Silicon Valley. Why is it porous? What, what is connecting up the network in, in Silicon Valley? And the answer is that the tribe of professionals who are professionally sort of, you know, financially incentivized to go and connect up the money and the ideas and the people, these are the venture capitalists. They are, you know, their job is to get up in the morning, have breakfast with one entrepreneur that they might fund next week, and then have 14 cups of coffee, hopefully decaffeinated before they go to bed. They're gonna meet the guys that they, the, the, the entrepreneurs they backed in the last few months and now they're on the board of their company. They're going to meet the engineers that they might try to recruit into their portfolio companies. They're going to meet potential customers for their portfolio companies. They're going to meet fellow investors because they may, you know, somebody else has done the Series A for a startup. They might want to lead the Series B financing. Uh, and so they circulate around the ecosystem. You can see this physically when you go to Silicon Valley. Go to the Rosewood Hotel on Sand Hill Road and hang out there. It's just VC meeting with person, VC meeting with person, all over this restaurant and then the bar in the evening. And, and so that's, that's what they do. They are the bees, you know, buzzing around, bringing the pollen to the flowers. Fabulous. Okay, so I want to move, yes, go ahead. I don't have a mic, but just, do you see that happening in Europe now as well? Because, I mean, originally we had like, I think 66 cities with unicorns, and now we see all those classes like Berlin, Munich, London, Paris. Um, do you think that's a general trend that applies to the <coughs> or is there something specific about Silicon Valley? Um, it's a good question that sort of actually follows naturally all about what I just said. Because, uh, you know, my analysis, well, let me just back up a second. So I just told you why I think that venture capital was essential to why Silicon Valley overtook Boston. Boston had some venture capital, but when you go interview those people, they are radically different to the ones who were on the, the West Coast because they were far less risk friendly. You know, they were willing to back something if there was a product, there was already some revenue, and there was a decent management team in place. That's not real venture capital. I mean, one person there who had been active in the 1970s said with huge pride, I made 40 investments in my career, not a single one lost money. If you say that in Silicon Valley, they laugh in your face. I mean, you didn't take enough risk if none of them lost money. Um, so way more uh, early stage, uh, aggressive risk friendliness. Okay, so that's why Silicon Valley succeeded. The other great sort of success story in terms of venture ecosystem has been China between around 2005 and 2020. Incredible explosion of technological success stories. Why? Well, I went there, I interviewed all these people who were involved in the early stages, and all of them, bar none, Sina, Sohu, NetEase, Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent, Ctrip, Ichnet, 100% of these people had uh, kind of Silicon Valley style venture capital with American lawyers writing the articles of agreement, you know, Cayman Island parent company, dispute settlement under US law, a plan to go you know, public on the NASDAQ. It was the Silicon Valley playbook, lock, stock and barrel, brought to China and then it took off. My analysis of Europe, to answer your question, is that the missing ingredient, kind of like Boston back in the 70s, has been this risk capital that connected up the ecosystem. And now that risk capital is coming in, now that Axel, one of the companies I write about in my book, you know, has a long established London office. Sequoia, which I write about in my book, has a newish uh, London operation. Um, you know, Index Ventures is a you know, California sort of European hybrid. Again, a big presence in London. You know, Atomico, which grows out of um, the founder's experience founding Skype and being funded by Silicon Valley people. I mean, basically Silicon Valley has come to Europe. And Silicon Valley is going to connect up the engineers and the ideas with the money and the network. And it's going to happen the same way in Europe, just like it did. I would say that Europe is kind of where Silicon Valley was in 1985.
Excellent. So I want to move now to one of the aspects that I really liked about the book, and it's this a very enjoyable read about the typology of venture capital. And just to give you a sense of a context, so in the class, we have discussed a couple of times why is it that not every company is good for venture. And you have a couple of very interesting uh, tweet quotes in the book by well-known VCs, such as Bill Gurley, general partner at Benchmark, who tweeted in January 2019, the vast majority of entrepreneurs should not take venture capital. You also cite tweets by Josh Koppelman, who's the founder of First Round Capital, uh, a pioneering seed stage fund uh, that led the seed round in Uber. He tweeted, I sell jet fuel. Some people don't want to build a jet. But what we've spoken about less in the class is the different types of VCs that exist. So conditional on knowing that you want some jet fuel, how do you go about picking and what exists out there? And what, what is this matching process that's in the background? Yeah, so, uh, you know, when I first went to Silicon Valley and I made the first, did the first kind of, you know, 20, 30, even 40 interviews in the first two or three trips, uh, I got a lot of stories about this matching process, which are sort of very cute, but you kind of think, oh, it's a bit too cute. I don't really, I'm not sure if that's really the full story. So I went to see, you know, Patrick Collison, who was the founder of Stripe, uh, the big fintech company. And I said, why did you take money from Sequoia, Michael Moritz, rather than money from various other people who were trying to you know, invest in Stripe? And he said, well, you know, the thing was that I was seeing Michael Moritz at the Sequoia office, and when he came out of the office with me, he walked me to the front door, and he saw my bike. He saw my bike? I go, yeah, so he saw your bike, so what? So he said, well, you know, you know, Mike, you know, as you know, you know Michael, he, he likes bicycling. And I go, yeah. He said, so, so he saw my bike, and it was a Cervelo road bike, and then he pulls up a picture on his phone and shows me. And see, so he saw this. I'm like, yeah. And he goes, well, then, you know, Michael, he said, asked me, you know, what's my fastest time on the old La Honda climb, which is a sort of, if you're into cycling in, in Silicon Valley, apparently you go on the old La Honda climb, and then you record your time and everybody's super competitive. Of course, they're kind of competitive in Silicon Valley. Um, so, you know, Patrick Collison says, my time is 21 minutes and 32 seconds. And Moritz goes, oh, that's, you know, yeah, that's quite good. And then, you know, he has to put him down by saying that his partner, Jim Goertz, has an even better time. But, you know, he's kind of secretly quite respectful of that time. And, you know, I'm, I'm still, like, a bit confused by this. You know, do you really bond over cycling? Is that how people make investments in Silicon Valley? And I mean, I think there's sort of a, an element of, you know, truth that you need, you know, when you invest in a company, you're going to be married to it until it goes public. And that could be four years, five years, seven years, 10 years. I mean, these days it can be quite a long time because of the rise of growth capital. So there needs to be a kind of human bonding. Um, there also, though, more seriously, and this is what people, because it's less cute, don't like to talk about quite so much. Um, but in the end, when you go back for the 50th or the 60th interview, you, you start to get there. There needs to be some connection between what the venture capitalist believes is his or her value add. Like, are they an engineer who really understands sort of, you know, network architecture and wants to kind of get into the weeds about um, network architecture and, and that? Or are they actually a marketing expert who wants to invest in a company where the tech is kind of fine, but you need to sell it to people, and you need to find enterprise customers, and you need to understand what kind of sales chief is going to get under the hood of the big corporations and do big enterprise contracts. So different VCs have different kinds of um, personality that bond with different kinds of founder, and different kinds of expertise that will be relevant to different sorts of company. Um, I mean, just to give you one also a cute story, but I think in a way a revealing one. Um, you know, the founder of Sequoia uh, was uh, called um, Don Valentine. And he had been a Navy water polo player before becoming a business guy. And it turned out that being a Navy water polo player and having the physique to match had some relevance with particular investments. And one of his first success stories was Atari, which was the um, you know, first video game maker. It made this thing called Pong, where you move this paddle up and down the video game screen. And then you try to kind of get the ball before it went past you. Uh, 
And it was such a simple game that you could be as drunk as you liked and still play it. So it sold very well in bars in Berkeley uh, at the beginning. And the, the guys who invented this were perpetually stoned and, you know, chaotic. And, you know, their idea of sort of filing an idea was to scroll it down on a piece of paper, you know, tear the end of the paper and stuff it in the back pocket and then lose it. I mean, the board meetings took place in hot tubs with cans of beer floating around. And if you wanted to invest in Atari, you were told to come to the board meeting, get your clothes off and get in the hot tub. Now, Don Valentine, because of that water polo thing, when he took his shirt off, his authority went up, not down. So he got into the hot tub, and he was extremely impressive and imposing, and he essentially figured that these chaotic, you know, stoned, brilliant kind of engineers would actually turn from a sort of crazy circus into a commercial company if he sort of, by force of character, you know, made them have an actual accounting system and like a payment system that meant, because what happened at Atari was that you got a check on Friday, which was supposed to be your salary, and then you had to leg it to the bank and cash the check as soon as, for, because if you were slower than your coworkers, there'd be no money left in the account. You, would, you just wouldn't be paid. So, I mean, it was total chaos, and the VC reckoned that if you could impose some order on this madness, you could turn a company with inspired products into actually a profitable company with inspired products. So he did the investment, and it was a great outcome for him. But again, it's to your point. I mean, the, the personality has to fit the opportunity, and that's true of venture capital generally. Fabulous. So another one of the chapters that is super interesting in the book from my perspective is the Chinese uh, or the China chapter. And going back to Emil's question before, I wanted to revisit our discussion about China. So a couple of, of data points. Um, so to give some context, so in 2017, China surpassed the US as the world's top source for venture returns. And in 2018, China quartered 206 homegrown unicorns, basically private firms valued at more than 1 billion. And this number was basically three more than the US. So it's also surpassed the US in terms of unicorn creation. Now we spoke a little bit about why the venture capital model worked in China, but I want to revisit one of the themes that you discussed in this chapter, which is the role of American-trained Chinese investors. Can we talk a little bit about that? Because all of these guys, many of them, may want to go back to their home countries or go to China or somewhere else. What's the role of being trained in understanding venture capital and then going back to your country? What happened in China? Well, I, so I said a bit about this in general, but let me be specific. So let's take Alibaba as an example. Um, the Series A investment in Alibaba um, took place because two uh, Taiwanese Americans who had um, been respectively to Harvard and Yale and had then worked respectively uh, in finance in New York and then in uh, commercial law doing Wall Street stuff uh, in the case of the guy who went to Yale. And um, these two uh, fetched up in Hong Kong, which was sort of a natural place if you spoke Chinese and China was booming. Uh, and as Taiwanese Americans, obviously they did. And one of them, Joe Tsai, who by then had switched from law to investing, identified this company called Alibaba with this kind of you know, energetic founder called Jack Ma. And he tried to persuade his friend Shirley Lin, the one who had been to Harvard and then to Wall Street, who was now working at Goldman Sachs, was the youngest woman partner that Goldman ever had. And she was in Hong Kong, and she was sort of interested in the Silicon Valley boom. This is like 1998, and Silicon Valley is booming. And there's just the beginnings of uh, Chinese uh, students who went to Stanford, got the internet, boom in their blood and then try to repeat the thing back in China. So they would come through Hong Kong with business models for how they were going to replicate, you know, the Google for China or whatever. And they would come through Hong Kong and they would go to Goldman Sachs, they would meet Shirley and they would pitch her on these company ideas. And so Joe Tsai says to Shirley, hey, there's this company uh, in, um, uh, in Shenzhen and it's called Alibaba. It's kind of like a China Yellow Pages. We should go see it together, maybe we'll invest together. And Shirley's like, yeah, whatever, whatever. You know, it doesn't, not interested. 
And then eventually, uh, after a while, it turns out that Goldman is thinking of doing a separate investment in another China Yellow Pages business, but it's a kind of rather well-known entrepreneur. It's highly valued. And this Alibaba thing, which is kind of a scrappy outfit, you could, you could basically buy a whole chunk of it for almost no money at all. So she says, oh, maybe this is a good idea. So she goes with her friend Joe Tsai, and they go visit. And there's this kind of slightly smelly apartment building where it stinks of pot noodles and socks because people don't wash, and you know, it's, it's the whole kind of startup scene. And so that's kind of promising, right? That shows you know, pa passion and focus on the job. And they kind of like Jack Ma, and they decide to do this investment. I think it's $5 million for maybe a quarter of the company, if I got that right. Um, and uh, they go ahead and they do this. And along with that investment comes the Goldman Sachs lawyers. And this is extremely important, because the Goldman Sachs lawyers write the, uh, the sort of investment agreement, the term sheet, uh, in a way that has these features I quickly mentioned before, the parent company in the Cayman Islands. Now, this is important because you can have stock options uh, issued through that vehicle. In China in 1998, stocks were quite new, right? The two uh, public stock exchanges, in, I think in Shanghai and Shenzhen, um, had been opened in 1990, so public equity was about eight years old. And variations on public equity, like stock options or preferred stock for investors, which is a typical format in Silicon Valley, just didn't exist. You couldn't translate uh, stock option into Chinese without specifically inventing a new term in Chinese to do that. Um, and so, you know, Jack Ma had no idea what stock options were, but he was getting this Cayman parent and he could do stock options. And so he asked, you know, some friends of his, well, explain to me how you use this thing. And it was, you know, you can hire super talented people uh, who wouldn't normally come and join your company when it's a startup because you can't afford to pay them much. But if you give them stock, i.e. a share in the future, and they're excited about your future, you can pay them almost nothing, and you can still hire them. So uh, he thinks, oh, that's a good idea. And his first idea that, is that one of the investors, Joe Tsai, um, could switch from being an investor to an employee. So he talks to Joe Tsai about this, and he says, well, you know, what would it take? Joe Tsai is making $600,000 at the time. He agrees to come and work for Alibaba for $600,000 not 600,000, $600, right? So they, they, they knock off three zeros from his salary, um, but he's given so many stock options that it's totally worth his while. And so that's the first uh, coup. He gets, you know, so Alibaba hires this person who has been to Yale Law School, been to Wall Street, is a sort of worldly, you know, American-style investor who really knows how to connect Alibaba to all of the business ideas that exist in the US and uh, take it to the next level. Then uh, Jack Ma says, you know, I really need, you know, a really sort of next level um, technologist. What about if I hired somebody who's already in Silicon Valley and has already built a premier, um, you know, website user interface uh, on a Silicon Valley standard, which will take my Shenzhen startup to an entirely new level? So he says, okay, Yahoo, that's a successful company. The chief technology officer is Chinese American. He's called John Wu. I'm going to hire John Wu. So he goes to talk to John Wu, and at first it's like a joke. You know, you're a little startup in Shenzhen. Why the heck would I leave Yahoo to come and work for you? But you know, with enough stock options, you can make it happen. So Jack Ma gives him a shed load of stock options, gives him even more stock options so that John Wu can hire a whole team of people for Alibaba who stay in Silicon Valley. Right? They have an office for Alibaba in Silicon Valley full of people who are joining only because of stock options. And that is why you know, Alibaba was able to scale from being a good sort of plucky Chinese startup to a world-class company because it hired world-class talent. And it couldn't have hired the world-class talent like you know, Joe Tsai and John Wu without the stock options. So I think it's not an exaggeration to say that, you know, venture capital made all of the difference to why China succeeded in tech. Uh, 
So we have spoken a lot about the opportunity of venture capital. I'm very optimistic, and I, I want to be, I want to change a little bit the tone and think about some skepticism about the industry. So there's a paper by Josh Lerner and Ramanananda, and they mention three critiques to the industry, and you do mention them as well in your book. And so I want to go through them one by one, if that's okay. So the first one is that venture capital uh, seems to be optimized for a narrow slice of technological innovation. And uh, you discuss in your book that while that may be true, uh, it's also kind of like a narrow way of looking at venture capital. You're skeptical about the skepticism. So <laughs> can, we, can we talk a little bit about that? Well, look, I, I, I mean, in a big picture way, of course, I accept the point that there are limited uses for venture capital, right? You, you can't do everything with it. It's not going to replace JP Morgan, uh, obviously. Um, but it, I, that feels like a sort of beside the point. I mean, even if you narrowed it down and said, well, at the moment, you know, fewer than 1% of the companies that get started in the US every year receive venture capital, which is, which is the case. Um, you know, shouldn't it be aspiring to finance like 10% of all the companies or 50% of all the companies? Why is it so narrow? Well, you know, I think you're looking through the wrong end of the telescope. If it does something specific and quite narrow, but it does it very well, that is a useful thing for society. So I don't, I think an error of omission by a, you know, aircraft leasing, um, you know, finance, um, is not terribly good at real estate mortgages, right? But it's not supposed to be. It's fine. Um, so that, that would be my first point. But I also think that venture capital has acquired over the last sort of 25 years this reputation for being only software. Um, because software returns with the advent of the internet in the mid-1990s, or the, the commercialization of the internet, software returns have been so amazing that venture capitalists tended not to do so much hardware and deep tech and so forth. But it can do hardware and deep tech and so forth, and the proof of that comes from the pre-internet phase of venture history. The first sort of you know, quarter or so of my book is about that early phase, and it's about the semiconductor investments, the personal computer investments, the Cisco's, in other words, the network uh, equipment uh, investments. Um, so there is a whole prehistory of hardware, which is now kind of coming back a bit if you look at battery companies or other kinds of you know, hard tech relating to climate change. Um, it's coming back. AI is software, but AI is also kind of quite hard. So it's, it's a version of, of hard tech, one could argue. So I think the aperture is wider than some people think. Um, uh, and to the extent that it's not hugely wide, I would say that's fine. It's a financial specialty with a specialized use. Oh. Now, the second criticism is the following, that a few deep-pocketed investors play a disproportionate role with the lack of diversity among VCs impacting the types of businesses that get funded. And so to give you some statistics again, uh, we, you know, we have that is off February 2020, women accounted for shockingly 16% of investment partners at VC firms, in contrast to, let's say, 38% of lawyers, 35% of doctors are women, as well as the founders of companies, also a venture capital-backed company, also not tend to be uh, women, just to cite one aspect of diversity. So what are your thoughts on that criticism of the industry? Yeah, I think that's an important and good and correct criticism, which I echo in my book. Um, I also point out that uh, at the time I was writing, 3% of uh, venture partners in Silicon Valley were African American, uh, which is not only way below the population share, but also way below the benchmarks if you look at you know, the share of African Americans in you know, investment banking or other professions. It's higher than it is in venture capital. So these, this is a problem. Um, and, um, you know, it's a problem. I mean, uh, that's, you, you could end the conversation there. It's a problem that needs to be fixed. I do write about the case of Kleiner Perkins, a venture partnership which tried to address the uh, under recruitment of women and um, ended up in trouble. And the point of the story is to show that when you try to um, address a diversity uh, deficit, it needs to be more than just a sort of click of the fingers decision by the boss. You can't say, oh, we're going to fix it and hire 
you know, five women, roughly, which is what John Doerr did at Kleiner Perkins. Because if you don't change the culture of the people working for you at Kleiner Perkins, then there'll be sexual harassment and, you know, discrimination against women. You'll hire women, but they will not flourish there. And that's exactly what happened at Kleiner Perkins. Elaine Powell, one of the uh, female investors there, brought a sexual harassment suit against uh, Kleiner Perkins, which, whatever the outcome of the suit, the, the process of the suit exposed some pretty uh, shocking behaviors on the part of the male uh, partners. So it's a problem. OK, and the third um, you know, criticism is that the emphasis on governance that was the cornerstone of venture capital in the very early days has decreased over time and has led to more so-called founder-friendly terms, which might be responsible for many of the governance scandals that we've seen recently. For example, the stories of the founders of WeWork, Uber, FTX, et cetera. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, now, this is another criticism that I agree with and that I actually push with some determination uh, in writing about the WeWork case study and the Uber case study, which both I look into a lot in the book. And you know, the point here is that at the beginning of both stories, WeWork and Uber, you had an investment from the same partnership, funnily enough, uh, Benchmark, which did the Series A investment. And Benchmark is a very much a specialist in you know, going on the board, you know, really being part of the early decision making, um, rolling your sleeves up. And you know, one of them said to me, you know, I'm so far you know, down in the weeds when I look up, I can't even see the sky. Maybe it's a slightly mixed metaphor, but whatever. You get the point. Uh, they really believe in being involved in governance. Um, and they were involved in governance. And at the beginning, with WeWork and Uber, both investments were you know, good Series A investments. WeWork, believe it or not, uh, was making a profit at one point early on, uh, something that they forgot to do when they were bigger. And then what happens is that as these companies uh, got bigger, Instead of going public after three years, say, or two years, which is what Amazon had done in the 1990s, that was the typical pattern. You know, if you were a really successful startup in the 90s, you would take one Series A round, you would do extremely well, you would go public. By the time you get to the 2010s, um, there was this flourishing of growth equity. In other words, more private investment that comes along when you're already worth a billion dollars uh, valuation. And instead of writing you a check for, I don't know, $20 million at Series A, these growth investors can write a check for 200 million uh, in Series C or Series D. So you don't need to go private so early anymore. And this is what was happening with Uber and WeWork. And the Series D investors uh, were not interested in governance. They would write an enormous check and say, we are so confident in you, Mr. Founder. You've already created a unicorn company. You must be a genius, so we don't need a board seat. We're not going to petty fog around with second guessing your decisions. Whatever you do, we're good with it. Oh, would you, by the way, like some extra board seats, which you can just choose yourself, which friends of yours you would like to put on your board? so that if there are any pesky people on the board like Benchmark, we don't like Benchmark, do we? Yeah, anyway, if you don't, if you don't like Benchmark and what it's saying to you, we'll give you some extra uh, directors on the board who will be your friends and they can outvote Benchmark. And just to make sure this is watertight, we'll, uh, we'll invent a new thing called super voting shares so that you, Mr. Founder, each of your shares will have 10 votes uh, and then, you know, whatever, benchmark says the shares that it owns will have fewer votes per share, so you can just overrule them. And now, Mr. Founder, you are the emperor of the company, as you should be, because you're a genius. That doesn't end up so well. If you don't have checks and balances on founders, um, you know, they're going to do bad stuff, and they're going to become hubristic. And that is precisely what happened with you know, Travis Kalanick at Uber and Adam Newman at WeWork. Most of the time, human beings uh, even if they are brilliant on some dimensions, have flaws on other dimensions. And those flaws need to be compensated for by checks and balances exercised by some form of governance. In American capitalism, uh, 
There is uh, governance in the form of early stage startups where the investor goes on the board and has enough power and influence to impose a check and a balance on the founder. There is an alternative form of governance in public companies where if the CEO does something stupid, the investors will sell the stock and then the stock price will fall and then that will be a target of a takeover bid exercising governance pressure. And there's yet a third version of successful governance in private equity and buyouts where you know, the buyout company buys all of the stock in the company and then has enormous skin in the game to make sure that that company is properly run. But what does not work is growth investing in hubristic unicorn founders where the growth investor doesn't go on the board. That's broken, and I say so. Great, and in, in terms of that last point, so who are the investors that are coming in at the late stage or you know, growth stage that are not requesting or then imposing this governance on the startups? Is it, is it VCs or is it other types of investors? Um, they tend to be crossover investors, who, meaning that they've crossed over from some other um, investment specialty. Uh, it, it, there's a, there's, it's not always the case. So Masayoshi Son and his vision fund, who were probably the least responsible growth investors in existence uh, at their peak, um, you know, in a move that he probably should not have made, uh, the former head of Sequoia sent me some internal memos and allowed me to quote them. And one of them, uh, one of these memos describes, you know, or compares Masayoshi Son to, um, you know, Kim Jong Un, the North Korean dictator, sort of lobbing missiles and sort of threatening to blow things up. And uh, he described, you know, Masayoshi Son as doing this to the venture capital industry, lobbying missiles full of money uh, at companies and destroying their governance because he didn't want to go on the board uh, and he didn't want to exercise oversight. So, in fact, SoftBank came from a background of, you know, the Vision Fund, Masayoshi Son, came from a background of having been an early stage investor in the 1990s. So that's a bit of an exception. But most of these investors are former hedge funds like Tiger Global, which began as a hedge fund and then became also a growth stage technology investor. Or they might be private equity companies like TPG, uh, which came from buyouts and then moved into uh, growth technology investment because there seemed to be so much money to be made there. So they didn't have the background of being venture investors and they didn't understand governance. Perhaps in another surprising turn of events, uh, Son did say at the end that he regretted what had happened with WeWork and he did admit it to his, let's say, less than positive role. He did admit that. Whether the admission <laughs> will govern his behavior in the future, we'll see. Okay, so in the last topic, um, I want to talk about the UK. Uh, I want to talk about the setting of the UK. This is where we're at. Um, and I want to think about what the government is doing and what things could the government do better. And again, to give you some context, so there's been some research as to the role of government in promoting venture capital and what's been basically the effects of these efforts. And some authors, including Thomas Helmut at Oxford, wrote a paper that said, look, roughly the government intervenes in one of two ways. In the first one, what you have there is that the, uh, the VC firms are established and managed by government employees, and uh, the evidence there is not great. These types of funds do poorly on average. Whereas the second form of intervention is more that the government provide investments or tax breaks or um, other sort of incentives to otherwise privately managed funds. And the evidence there is a bit more positive. And I would say the stellar example of this type of intervention is Israel's Yasma Fund. So what are your thoughts about UK policy? What do you think we can do, we can do better? Well, I think that's a great setup for saying that the British Business Bank uh, may not be optimal, right? I mean, you know, the Yosma experiment in Israel was very successful and noted for its um, sort of time-limited nature, right? Where uh, in round one, um, you know, the government in Israel wants to have a venture capital sector. There isn't one, but there's fantastic technology. Um, and so they want to convert the indigenous technology into indigenous startups with indigenous uh, venture capital. So they say, okay, we will incentivize private venture capital to come here, set up funds, 
by co-investing with those funds in their, in their fund one, the first round. Uh, and we will take the first losses, but we'll be very generous in allowing the uh, venture capital, the private investors, to take all of the upside if it succeeds. So this is an extremely generous sort of f financing structure. Uh, and a bunch of um, private groups come in to take advantage of it. And they do very well. And then in round two, if I get this right, uh, basically the government withdrew the subsidy and said, okay, you're now here, you've understood how to do it, you have your networks in Israel, you, knew, you know who the technologists are, have at it, but you don't need our subsidy anymore. That's excellent. What's not so good is to fund, you know, fund one and then fund two and then fund three, because then it becomes not a sort of kick-starting of the sector, but a permanent crutch for the sector. And that's unhealthy because the government will be, you know, the big limited partner. I mean, I think the, it's right to say the British Business Bank in the UK is the single biggest limited partner in venture capital. Meaning that if you are raising a fund in the UK, and you, you, you know, you, you are quite likely to go get money from the British Business Bank because it's the biggest source of money there is. And the conditions that come with that and the sort of culture that comes with that are simply, you know, less profit-oriented, less ambitious, less dynamic, uh, less flexible than if you take money from um, a purely private, profit-seeking, limited partner. Um, I think an example is that if you take money from the British Business Bank, you can't then turn around and take that money and go invest in a French startup, which you happen to find. Uh, and so that just limits what you invest in. And it's less good. It's best if you have venture partners who say, I want to find you know, the next company that's going to build you know, architecture for artificial intelligence or whatever it is, uh, and I will look at all the startups I can get, my, uh, get on my radar, and if they happen to be in Finland, fine. If the best one's in Finland, I'll invest there. If the best one is in UK, I'm delighted because I, had, I live in London. It's gonna be easier for me to go to the board meeting. But I'm not going to deprive my fund of the best opportunity just because of geography. And so there's a history of this in the US. Um, they tried to do government matching as well, the Small Business Investment Corporation program uh, in the 60s. And none of those funds really worked out, which is why it kind of died out. And I think in the UK, we have an over-dependence on government money as an LP. It would be better to spend that money on university um, basic science, training PhD scientists um, uh, to, to be great technologists. Uh, and then because of the engineering talent and the strength of university science, that ought to attract purely commercial venture capital to come into the UK and partner up with those uh, technologists. That would be a better use of government money to go into basic science. Continuing on that point, um, Josh Lerner in his book, Boulevard of Broken Dreams, he mentions how another one of these uh, mistakes, let's put it that way, that many governments around the world have made is that they forget what he calls the art of setting the table. So other than providing the capital that startups would need in order to you know, bring their ideas to, act to market, there's something to be said about making sure that the environment is there for startups to, you know, to arise to begin with, for uh, founders to find co-founders to work with, uh, for founders to get all the skills that they need to grow a business. What are your thoughts on that point? And do you think that the UK um, has you know, enough of that happening? You know, one piece of table setting is to ensure that you can transfer the good technology out of a university research lab and into a startup and that the royalty agreement that you make with the university is not too onerous to the entrepreneur. It's very risky to be an entrepreneur. If a lot of the upside is going to be hogged by the university, you won't maybe even do the startup in the first place. And my understanding is that Oxford has recently um, improved the terms, made it more favorable to the entrepreneur, and that's good. It would be nice if Cambridge, Imperial, and other sort of leaders in basic science were to follow the Oxford model. Um, I'm not sure if that's directly a role for the government or just something that the government could talk about and you know, encourage. Um, so that's one thing that could be better. Another thing 
is, um, you know, I've talked to some US investors who've set up uh, operations in the UK, and the single thing that appalls them the most is that you make an investment in a UK uh, startup, you say, great, you've now got nine months of capital, nine months of runway, until you're going to need to raise the next round of money. So make sure that you use the nine months as well as you possibly can to reach this agreed set of benchmarks so that then you're deserving of another round of financing. And then they, you know, the startup says, yeah, absolutely, we're going to do our absolute best, and we're, we've just signed a deal to hire these three brilliant people who are going to take us to the next level. And so the VC says, great, will you introduce me? I presume I can just go to your office and meet them. And they go, no, they're on gardening leave for six months. They can't, you know, they had a non-compete agreement at their previous employer. They can't come straight to us. They have to quit, wait for six months, and then come. But you've got nine months of runway, and they're going to spend six months on gardening leave. That's insane. In the US just recently, the uh, FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, has said that it wants to make non-compete agreements of that nature non-enforceable. It's already been the case forever that in California, they are non-enforceable. That's why talent can circulate quickly right, in California, because you can quit your startup on Friday and arrive at the new startup you're going to work for on Monday. Uh, and that's excellent for you know, the prospects of startups. The non-compete thing in the UK needs to be changed. Well, thank you very much. Please thank me in uh, yeah, thanking uh, Sebastian. Thank you.